So the next topic that we want to look at is comparisons of proteins. So there are two ways of doing this. One is what's called the Blossom method. And you can see the primary paper that was published in the, uh, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And the other is the PAM matrix. So there's two types of these mechanisms. The fundamental idea is the same, but the, but the basic calculations that go into it, into coming up with these numbers that populate these matrices, the substitution matrices are different. So let's look at Blossom. Blossom is a block sub substitution matrix. So what you want, what we want, and remember when we looked at um, when we looked at the Affine gap penalty, we actually looked at the Blossom 62 matrices where you saw numbers which compared, which were measures of and how how likely that amino acid is likely to be matched with another amino acid the same and you know those were the scores so this is now where we come to the discussion of block substitution matrix now you can go back to i think the module on sequence alignment gaps and and you look at some of that discussion so go take a look at that and come back so so how so how are these numbers generated where does one come up with these numbers so you process a sample of a small set of proteins or set of proteins. These might or might not belong to the same family, but they might not belong to the same family or might not belong to the same family, but there is a certain, there is a certain similarity, okay? So the proteins chosen in this block have no more than R sequence similarity. They, again, the blocks contain well-known. So the block is literally a, a list of, of sequences which are kind of aligned with each other without any gaps. Now, they might or might not belong to the same family, but they have no more than R sequence similarities, which means that uh, if you remember back when we when we did the exercise on the affine gap penalty, we realized that, that it was called the Blossom 62. So those numbers, those comparison matching similarity numbers came from a set of proteins whose similarity between those sequences was not greater than 62 percent okay so blossom 62 is a bit of a middle ground uh, a middle ground uh, thing and that's most commonly used because it's uh, you can have blossom or matrices with 30 percent uh, with 80 percent uh, similarity so that blossom 30 blossom 80 and again the question is when would you what matrix would you use and when would you rationalize using a particular blossom and it would be rationalized by the kinds of similarity searching that you intend to do if you want to do a similarity searching with sequences which are relatively divergent then you want numbers that come from blossom with a lower which was created from a family with lower percentages of similarity okay and the same thing for um, uh, complementarily for for something where you know that they come from the same family and there's high there's high similarity between the protein you're looking for and the matches that you want to make so for each of the 20 amino acids the log odd ratio is calculated this means from the database of proteins tested what are the chances given our divergence which is 62 percent an amino acid is likely to be substituted by another amino acid okay and so, well, now we use a new term called the log odd ratio. What is that? And so one of the ways we can look at that is let's first look at the definition of an odd ratio. Okay. Let's say, for example, there is a, a kind of a disease. Okay. It's, it's, it's pushed by a certain pathogen. And that disease, and just to keep it very simple, it's one kind of pathogen. And it is associated one, with one kind of symptom, let's say a mild fever. Now, let's say, for example, you have the outcome status. Plus means whether you have the fever. Minus means you don't have the fever. Exposure status means were you exposed to that pathogen. And the negative sign means you were not exposed to the pathogen. right? And so let's say, you know, if you were exposed to the pathogen and you had the fever, that goes into this column. If you were exposed to the pathogen, but you did not have a fever, that would go into this column, right? Exposure plus exposed, but no symptoms. Then if you were not exposed to the pathogen, but for some reason you 
demonstrated symptoms of a mild fever, which may have come from completely different, a completely different causation, then that would be here. And then if you were not exposed, which would be the rest of the population and didn't show any symptoms, you would fall under this category. Okay, so how do you calculate the odd ratio? So the odd ratio is calculated, remember, A, B, C, D, number of exposed cases, number of exposed non-cases, number of non-exposed cases, and exposed non-cases. So A over C, B over D, or A, D, A, D times B, C. And this is a formula that you would use to calculate the odd ratio. Now, sometimes based on, you know, based on the sample sizes you're looking at, the population sizes you're looking at, the odd ratios can be kind of unwieldy in terms of the numbers. Okay, and so you want to say, well, is that, but that's not the log odd ratio. So if you take the logarithm of the odd ratio, you get the log odd ratio. And here is an example, right? And this comes straight from Wikipedia, but it's a pretty good example. So let's say in a sample of 100 men, 90 drank the previous week. And in a sample of the same number of women, only 20 drank wine in the same period. Okay, the odds of a man drinking wine are 90 to 10 or 9 to 1. And so, for example, you know, drank wine, 100 men drank wine, 10 didn't drink wine, 20 drank wine. So you look at the formula from the previous slide, and you see that the likelihood of men drinking um, wine is 36 times the number of women drinking wine. Okay, so if you really think the log of the odds ratio is something which is, and you know, sometimes, and you can go and take a look at it, for example, if you want to plot a law of a, a kind of a, a set of data which is, which goes from one to several orders of magnitude. Okay, so you'll have one and a hundred and a thousand, and you can try this at home. So, you know, try, try graphing something uh, where you take 10, 100, 1,000, etc. And you'll see immediately that you get an exponential effect if you try to put it in, you know, if you if you scale it correctly. Now, what you might do to mitigate some of that, if you want to convert an exponential into a linear scale, you should take the log. So, for example, if you take the log of this ratio of 36, you'll get 3.584. So it's a much more manageable number. Um, so how do we get these numbers, right? How do we get these numbers? So let's put the log. Now these numbers, you know, they are obviously a lot of calculation. It depends upon what family. This is obviously a either a family or members of a non-family, but the sequences do not have greater than 62% similarity. And so how do you get the log, um, the log ratio? Let's go back to this formula. Um, let's say, for example, in a sequence, you expect a methionine to be found in a particular position, okay? And based on based on you know lots of similarity of that uh, of, of that family, a methionine is supposed to be found. So you expect to find a methionine. You find a methionine, okay? Then or you expect to find a methionine, but you find something X, okay? Let's let's call it a valine V. Then you don't expect to find a methionine. But you find a methionine, and you don't expect to find a methionine, but you find a valine. You see the difference? So you expect to find a methionine, and typically you will expect. Therefore, you know, now let's when we look at that graph, you'll see that you know something that is matched with itself has a higher number because that's the expectation. That number will likely be lower if you have a Blossom 30 matrix, for example. Okay, and so now let's look at let's look at this. And you'll see, obviously, the, the, the darker numbers are numbers which are associated um, with, with, a similar, with, with the identity, right? So, for example, a tryptophan matching with a tryptophan is 11. Now, now, the question is, well, if it just matches by itself, why aren't these numbers just 6 or 3, right? And the remaining are then negative, right? For example, the chances of, of finding a... Um, a cysteine uh, replaced by an alanine is obviously a lot higher than the chances of a cysteine being replaced by a P, which is a proline. Okay, but the question then is, well, why is this? Why aren't these numbers the same? Because these these numbers are then uh, normalized, if you will, 
against the number of amino acids naturally occurring in that particular group of proteins that were used to create that block. Okay, so for example, and we understand that these numbers are generally higher because, you know, for example, if it's normalized against the propensity of an amino acid just occurring in a protein, and you can do this study from, from other resources too, and I suspect that a tryptophan, a W, is, occurs less frequently in proteins, in, in proteins, okay? And so if you divide it, normalize it against a smaller number, then your odd ratio is going to be a higher number, okay? And that's how these numbers are calculated. So you can see, you know, there's going to be positive numbers, zeros, if there's a relatively high propensity, sometimes you'll get a number like one. So for example, a histidine replacing an asparagine is not really bad. It's not bad in the sense that it's a positive number. Okay, so you find positive numbers like that. You have zeros and then you have really, really negative numbers too. Okay, and that's kind of the calculation of the uh, of the odd ratio uh, for a Blossom matrix. Okay, so Blossom R, R is a percentage convergence, which is the number of sequence, number of um, uh, how similar the sequences are, not more than, not more than that R percentage. So Blossom R, you're going to have a Blossom 80, a Blossom 45. So these are the low end, depending on what you're trying to, you know, if you're trying to match divergent sequences, that what, that's what you're going to look at. So Blossom is, Blossom 62, the one we use in the affine gap penalty uh, discussion is the most commonly, is the most commonly, commonly used. Now let's come to the PAM, which is a point accepted mutation. So a point accepted mutation is, um, is how do, how does it work? So it works, so for example, we are talking about similarities, uh, similarities, blocks created from proteins which have specific similarities. And the odd ratios are compared to, you know, what kind of occurrences there are. So in a PAN matrix, 71 families of closely related proteins were used as a basis, okay? So they are families, and they are very closely related, and 71 families were used. And you construct a phylogenetic tree. Now, I put a question mark here, a module or two from now, when we begin to discuss cladistics, cladistics and um, and phylog phylogenetic analysis, we look at what that definition is. What it basically you're doing is you're doing a many-to-many -many comparison and then matching the sequences as they are met. And then as a slight divergences, you're, you know, you're going to put, uh, you're going to kind of organize them slightly differently. When the ones which are the most closely related in terms of sequence uh, identities and similarities will cluster together. Okay, and we look at what phylogenetic trees are. So they found 1572 mutations from these 71 families of proteins, and the mutations means that a, a an amino acid which was not expected has been found there. Okay, so then these sequences aligned met the criteria of 85% similarity up the phylogenetic tree, and the highly targeted mutations were thus obtained. Okay, so when you put ones with 85% similarity, you took these particular cluster, 85% similarity, you, you made those into a block, if you will, and then the ones which were replaced or were mutated or amino acids which showed up there, which were not supposed to be there, resulted in, um, those were the mutations. And so now these mutations are like the replacements with another amino acid in the log odd ratio calculation with the blossom. Okay, and so now you have the mutability. Okay, so in addition, in, uh, in, in instead of replacement, you have a mutability. That is a ratio of the number of times a substitution was seen, okay, to the number of times an amino acid occurred in an alignment. So how many times did, for example, um, asparagine had a mutability ratio of 134? So 134 times, uh, 134 mutations were seen when compared to the number of times an amino acid occurred in an alignment, and here are the numbers. And once again, you'll see that the higher the the presence of a of an amino acid in the protein, these numbers are different. And as I said, remember cysteine and tryptophan. So cysteine and tryptophan were the highest numbers in the blossom, which means that their occurrence is relatively is relatively small, right? 
And because their occurrence is relatively small, when you normalize against a small number, you'll find that cysteine is 12 and tryptophan is 17. Once again, they have very big numbers. And again, you can use, so again, you use mutations from highly similar families of proteins. Um, and, and you'll see these numbers are slightly different. You will still get, again, you can see that, you can see that the way these are arranged, even the way these are arranged are almost arranged in similarity. So you see this green area where the numbers are positive basically are towards the, are towards the kind of the diagonal of the matrix. Okay, these are the diagonals of the matrix and the off diagonal terms, except for example, when tryptophan matches with arginine, you'll find again, so the, so the notion of the, of the log odd ratio type of calculation is exactly, is exactly the same. And there is some uh, normalization against the number of times a, an amino acid occurs and that's what the previous table showed you. Now remember Blossom and PAM are kind of opposite to each other okay because we're talking about similarities versus mutations you see that the higher the PAM number the higher the PAM number the lower is the Blossom number. Okay, so you see this, it goes from, and so these are the different matrices, 100, and depend upon what, depending upon what you want to see, you will, um, uh, you will, so for example, this is 90% similarity in those proteins that were taken, and 100 is because that, the, that means the mutabilities were very less, okay, so the number of mutations or the measure of the mutations was significantly less. So you see there's some comparison, but again, this captures the mutability, this compares the similarity, and therefore mutability in a sense is what are the differences, okay, so the smaller the differences, the larger the similarity, right, and that's how this works. Um, here is uh, just an example of a tool. We won't really discuss this, but you can go around and play with this um, if you want. Uh, you know, just take a bunch of sequences and you can do a multiple sequence alignment. A multiple sequence alignment is generally the alignment of three or more biological sequences. Don't go with the three or more. When I say more, you go 10,000. You can do genome level multiple sequence alignments, okay? Because remember, we talked about olfactory receptors, so you had several thousand, um, several hundred of these uh, matched against several hundred because we talked about, and you can go back and look at the slide, the Weissman Institute of Science, um, they categorized the olfactory receptors in terms of families and subfamilies.